Honorable Chief Justice retired, distinguished delegates of this conference, good afternoon. I just sat uh, listening to the dialogue here, although I went in and out and in and out, but I was able to capture a bit of the dialogue and the discussions that have gone on since morning. And I just sat there imagining myself. This morning, I, I think I, I mentioned that I'm, I'm uh, from a psychology background, I'm a psychologist. And I sat there imagining what would it be like to go to my class, my DBA, my, my uh, psychology doctorate class, or my master's in clinical psychology, and start teaching them in my mother tongue, teach psychology in my mother tongue, or even Swahili for that matter. And I just pondered and wondered how I would begin, where I would get the right terminologies and the constructs that we teach in psychology, and I was dumbfounded. I also remember that I have lived in a country where no English is spoken. As an English speaker, I felt lost the first few months I was there. You go to the shop, you don't know what you are buying. You go to meetings, you have to sit with the interpreter next to you. I visited universities on, uh, when they had conferences, when I was invited and I sat in those conferences and I had no clue what they were talking about unless I had an interpreter with me. And therefore, this dialogue and this discussion actually has pointed out very deep issues and challenges and, of course, triumphs because our languages are part of who we are. But it is also because we are, most of us come from higher education institutions. It has given us a lot of food for thought in terms of how we teach, when we teach, what we teach, and so on and so forth, and how we practice for those of us who come from a professional background. But anyway, this moment is not for more speeches from me. Now it is my honor and pleasure to invite Dr. Willy Mutunga. I think all of us know about our Honorable Retired Chief Justice, what he has done. Well, he was a Chief Justice. What he has done when he was a scholar. And also, very important, his work in the human rights advocacy. Dr. Willy Mutunga, we are honored to have you this afternoon. Please welcome and make your address. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. I was told you had tea, so you're going to have late lunch. Uh, I'm sorry for violating your right to food. <coughs> Professor Ambassador Ruth Hirono, uh, De Deputy VC USIU, thank you for hosting us. The staff and the students of this university, thank you. I've seen quite a number of professors here. Mugane, Ngao, Kyoko, Maura, Mbote, Jill Guy. Kangara, and one of my great students who is a professor, Keith Muigai. Oh, has he left? Yeah, I would, I would have withdrawn your degree if you had left before I spoke. <laughs> Distinguished scholars, I see my former colleague Nancy Barasa here, the public intellectuals present, and all the professionals, uh, guests, fellow Kenyans, of, and friends of Kenya. I'm sure the revolutionary spirit of Neville, uh, Neville Alexander will not begrudge me if I dedicated this for the lecture in his honor to the late Samir Amin, the anti-imperialist, pan-Africanist public and the organ organic revolutionary who died in Paris uh, last week. I'm sure both will have great time in the convent of our ancestors, and let me also add uh, Professor Okotho Okombo, who was my uh, colleague at the university. And I'm honored also in delivering the fourth lecture to further the, the lead of some of Africa's speakers who have given the previous three keynote speeches, namely Professor Mugane, uh, South Africa's uh, Max Price, and our very own Professor Ngugi Wathiongo. I'm glad that this conference is titled Africa Languages in Disciplines and Professions Conference. We are gathered here with scholars of language, linguistics, 
uh, literary critics to share thoughts on how the professions of language and law feed and enrich each other. This gathering underscores the importance of a, a multidisciplinary engagement and more efforts needed to, need to be made in this regard. Language has much to offer law as the latter is represented in the former. For lawyers, words both spoken and written are the main tools of their trade. And a good understanding of the rules of language by lawyers and judges alike will enable better making and application of rules of law. We would have done a great service to law and language if we convince <coughs> the lawyers in our midst to cease to glorify their uh, ignorance of the other disciplines by constantly and continuously calling themselves learned friends. Uh, let lawyers also know that the anti-legal centric approach, which is a multidisciplinary approach, brings in, in the languages of these disciplines, uh, thus enriching law and language in our legal discipline. Law and language uh, must desilo our disciplines if we are to solve the problem that Eric Obsborn urges us thus. Our world risks both explosion and implosion. It must change. The in re emphasizing up front the significance of in the disciplinary uh, approach in multidisciplines of learning and the point of construing law within the various societal contexts. I should underline the significance of the multidisciplinary approach law. No discipline or profession is self-sufficient. And even more importantly, law, which permeates virtually every other discipline, profession, and sector. The world is becoming all the more complex with the advent of technology, we are even now imagining the advent of artificial intelligence judges and lawyers and artificial uh, intelligence. Did I say artificial intelligence judges, right? Uh, we're imagining that and I would really love to see these robots here, political presidential petitions and see what what the results will be, but I'm sure they will probably be programmed by IEBC and the political parties. We know artificial intelligence is already at play in our profession. Somebody was telling me that uh, if the, the Supreme Court tells you to give your submissions 30 pages, you can write your submissions in 500 and they will be, uh, they will be reduced to 30 uh, in a very concise manner. And so the sophistication in various uh, sectors calling for an uh, interdisciplinary approach in both formulations of law and its interpretation, I'm glad to state that while at the judiciary we empowered judicial officers through the revamping, uh, revamping of the Judiciary Training Institute uh, with training on emerging areas of law such as technology of law, that a project is still, uh, you know, uh, going on. If any of us is disbelieving of the importance of this interdisciplinary approach, look no further than the legal training afforded to law students elsewhere, such as in the United States. Students are required to have training in another discipline such as sociology, economics, or political science before admission uh, to law. One of the great lawyers, professors of law in, uh, in East Africa, uh, Issa Shivji, uh, actually is the only one I know who uh, did science, physics, mathematics, chemistry, before he joined, he joined law. Uh, this is not for its own sake, but to equip such law students with more knowledge on other areas and they are the richer in their work for it. We are at a place in history where this will become an even 
the more critical going forward. I personally recall with pride my legal education in the University of Dar es Salaam. They, there was a court called the Social and Economic Problems of East Africa, which was a foundational law course. It later became a course named the Development Studies that was taken by all students in the university. And teaching law within its historical, social, economic, cultural, and political context began in Dar in the 1960s, and that's how, as a law student, one of my great professors was uh, the great Marxist Pan-African uh, historian, Walter Rodney, the author of the book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, whose enduring relevance is still with us. Now, in memory of uh, Neville Alexander, he was a revolutionary who contributed towards linguistic diversity and multilingual education in South Africa. He was born on 22nd of October 1936 in the Eastern Cape of South Africa. In 1955, he was awarded a BA in German and history. In 1956, he received an MA in German from the University of Cape Town. And in 1961, he was awarded a PhD from the University of Tübingen. He spent 10 years, 64 to 74, in prison on Robben Island for conspiracy to commit sabotage. Thereafter, he served in various positions in the area of language and policy in South Africa. He served as the director of the South African Committee for uh, Higher Education and as the director of project for the study of alternative education in South Africa. Before his death in 2012, he received the 2008 Interlingua Pax Award for his notable work in linguistics. It is in his honor that we are gathered here today to ask these critical questions. The objectives of the conference include examining how the language question relates to jurisprudence, pondering on the relationship between legal and everyday language, discussing how language influences notions of law and order, and delving into how the language question plays into democratic processes, court processes, regional conflicts, ethnic identities, and national politics. And in this keynote address, I intend to briefly reflect on these objectives by using our experience in the judiciary 2011 to 2012. In the areas of the development of jurisprudence, judicial policy, judicial training, and the administrative tasks, or collective, collectively we call it judiciary, uh, judicial transformation uh, from the margins. Let's have a bit of a background, and I begin by very briefly contextualizing our discussions against Kenyan's uh, historical background. The first part will deal with the pre-colonial period. The second part will examine the colonial period. And the final part, uh, look at the situation pre-2010 and post-2010. I think in the colonial period, a lot of this has been said, of course, by a lot of people that we spoke our different languages. You know, we had our, uh, our different traditional justice systems. And these traditional systems of law and government were clan-based and uh, led by councils of male orders in many communities. And during this historical epoch, the many accents of justice were celebrated and recognized. The colonial period, I think, I don't say much. I don't need to say much. You've been talking about it, I'm sure. The, the, upon the imposition and subsequent domination by British colonialism, the English language was imposed. And this introduction necessitated that language policies be developed, implemented, and modified to suit the objectives of the British colonial masters and I, I think that you can follow that history from 1909, if it hasn't been uh, 
you know, discussed uh, yet. At this stage in the colonial period, the British motives in terms of language policy were to keep the Africans beneath them by teaching them just enough of the English language to ensure basic communication and a docile labor force with no upward mo mobility. Alive to the fact that the Africans might band together and claim more liberties from the colonial masters, the colonial language policies including the weakening of the use of Kiswahili. And this is because the British recognized the value of Kiswahili language in developing a national identity. In the 50s, however, it became necessary for the colonialists to modify their language policies so as to counter the threat of nationalism that was sweeping through the country in the push for equality and ultimately uh, independence. And as Ngugi states, colonialism was a process of alienating people from their total environment, economic, political, and cultural base. The quickest and long-lasting means was, alien was alienating people from their language. At the outbreak of the Mau Mau War of Independence, the language adopted was English only for instruction. Kiswahili and local languages were seen as, unifying, as a unifying factor for the Africans and it was deemed necessary to strip that part of their identity away. The post-colonial period, in 1965, the Magistrates' Cause Act was passed and we all remember that it abolished the native courts that had operated uh, during the colonial period, giving way to the so-called the integration of the justice system. And this state of affairs was not remedied until 20, the 2020, uh, 2010 constitution was implemented. And Article 159, Sabatco 2 of the constitution was in place. African justice systems had fought their way back into our country's jurisprudence. And the Constitution now decrees that African justice systems would operate under the values of the Constitution. And some of these values are in Article 10, they include inclusiveness, integrity, equality, equity, uh, participation of the people, etc. And that has cleared the way to the end of also the male-dominated structures uh, for the administ administration of traditional justice. Articles 10 and 27 of the Constitution do not countenance the traditional argument that I heard from during Jekai that the male orders represent the youth and the women and the community in general. The resurrection of the repugnant clause, and you see it there in 159, about morality and justice cannot reflect British notions of morality and justice as before, but the justice and morality of the Constitution, Kenyans have enacted, adopted, and decreed, and promulgated. So the, you also know that immediately after independence, the focus was on unifying the nation as a whole. And as a result, the government policy in 66 was to promote Kiswahili language as a national language. And this was seen to impact negatively the growth of the vernacular languages. In 1974, Jomo Kenyatta decreed that uh, Kiswahili must be the language of parliamentary debate. And this was in contrast, contrast with the 75 constitutional amendment that provided that English was to be the only language of legislation. It was obvious that the colonial policy of entrenching English as the language of power had seeped in. And in 1979, President Moy initiated an amendment uh, of the constitution so that either language could be used for parliamentary debates. And during the constitutional process, it was clear that many Kenyans were dissatisfied with the place of local languages under the law. Among the views that the people of Kenya gave to the uh, Constitution of Kenya Review Commission, CKRC, 
And I think we have two commissioners who are in that commission, uh, Professor Githu and Nancy Barasa. The, the views on language specifically recognize and respect all Kenyan linguistic communities that all Kenyan languages should be respected, promoted, reserved, and developed. Kiswahili should be the national language. Kiswahili and English should be the official languages. So in post-2010, there are now constitutional provisions that reflect uh, the will of Kenyans on this issue. Uh, Article 71 provides that the national language is Kiswahili, while the official languages of the state are both English and Kiswahili. The state is bound by the constitution to promote and protect the diversity of language uh, of the people of Kenya. And further, the state should promote all forms of national and cultural expression through literature, the arts, traditional celebrations, science, communication, information, mass media, publications, libraries, and other cu cultural heritage. And in 2011, the government set up the technical committee to oversee the development of a languages of Kenya policy, and a draft policy was finalized in 2014. The aims of this policy include the equitable treatment of the Kiswahili and English languages and to initiate dialogue on multilingualism with language communities. It, it also aims to develop and promote community languages for use as media of instruction in the early childhood and lower primary education. In the course to bring the judiciary closer to the people, uh, various uh, measures have been be implemented and these ones, a lot of them have to do with access to justice, what I call access to the formal, uh, formal, formal courts. But the mobile courts, of course, take the judiciary to, you know, where the, the people are. And at the end of the day, the issue of law language in most countries, you know, problematizes is the use of formal courts as the only forms of administration of justice. We forget that in Kenya, there is evidence that less than 5% of the population use, uses formal courts for different reasons. And it's because of this that the Training Institute in Kenya started Alternative Justice Systems Project that has various pilots in Kenya. And there has been a debate on how to bridge the two systems, the formal jurisprudence and the without the law jurisprudence. Since the, uh, the alternative justice systems of the confidence of the majority of the people as forums for the administration of justice, is it not possible that the decisions arrived at there could be given the coercive power by the formal courts? For example, can the elders' decision in a matter in a village be filed in court as a consent judgment, a file opened and the judgment uh, filed therein? I'm sure elders would be happy to find that their decisions are not in vain. Besides, I believe such filing will ensure that the same disputes do not, uh, are not resurrected in, in, the, in the future. And I believe these alternative justice systems would enrich our jurisprudence as a language, as their languages find their way into the dominant jurisprudence, as Ngugi illustrates, and enrich it. And in the case of Kenya, Professor Kimani Njogu is here, uh, once told me that if we translate our constitution and laws in Kiswahili first, and then Kiswahili to national languages, Kiswahili would also be enriched. Uh, let, let, let me think about law and language in, in terms of uh, theory. Uh, my take is that both law and language do not exist in a vacuum. Both law and language are expressions of economic, social, cultural, and political power. 
They are also expressions of domination, oppression, and exploitation, and all these aspects are fundamental to any status quo. It should never be forgotten that the law and language are also expressions of resistance to societal status quo. Mediums of reform, change, hope, optimism, and above all, change. Now, this is the historical, economic, social, scientific, cultural, and ideological and political context that bo both law and language should be studied, analyzed, interpreted, researched, and taught. Now, let me, because I've used the word uh, status quo, just very, very, very briefly clarify the sense of the global status quo and its resistance within the context of Kenya and indeed any country in the global south by telling two stories that I must beg your pardon up front if you have already heard me telling these stories. The, the global status quo is captured in this story I heard in Guatemala uh, about the Mexican president who uh, called an urgent meeting and on live TV he told the Mex Mexicans that he had bad news and good news and the good news was that all their debts had been forgiven and they were now free people uh, but the bad news was that they had to leave Mexico within the six hours because the country wasn't theirs. The, the other story is about Uganda. Some wise politician in Uganda formed a party whose objective was to bring the British back because he believed that colonialism was better than what you know they had. And in the election, he got only two votes. And when he asked his wife what ha his wife what happened, the wife told him he was foolish because the British never left. So we struggle to identify as countries our interests given what is clearly in the world today and in our own country, the domination from the imperialism of the West and the East. Okay, and the politics remains fundamental to the status quo and its resistance. And we find ourselves now as public intellectuals, going back to the discussions during the Cold War about uh, paradigms of liberation, uh, about how the globe and the planet is going to be uh, saved so that we create a just, humane, equitable, peaceful, and prosperous uh, planet. And these uh, discussions have come back now uh, with discussions on class struggles as engines on transformation. And the beauty of it is that uh, they are being discussed and dogmatically, uh, not like in the 70s uh, in the University of Nairobi and uh, Dar es Salaam and other places. Now, I also want to say I agree with Ngugi when he argues in one of his papers that, you know, yes, language is an expression of power. And he takes us to a, a courtroom where he says that our court system has no room for African language speakers. The defense, prosecution, and judge occur in a linguistic sphere totally removed from the person whose guilt or innocent is on the line. That is, if he happens to be an African language speaker. And this is the way it was in the colonial era. This is the way it is in the post-colonial era. And the one could add that the African language speaker finds herself bewildered, marginalized, and oppressed by the courtroom, the language spoken, the confusion of interpretation, and the realization that this is indeed not a forum that will guarantee our justice. The late uh, great scholar Kotho Gendo used to tell a story which reinforces this argument by Gugi. A person in Nyanza walked in a court and loudly offered his greetings to all gathered in the court. He was found guilty of contempt of court. And as he was led to prison, 
he was heard muttering and murmuring, what a court is this that jails people for greeting those gathered in it? Somebody talked about the interpretation. Uh, the only person who I know who has written on that issue is Alamin Mazurui. The difficulties of uh, interpretation. I don't know the source, but that will be very, very, very interesting. Because it's true what uh, the professor who talked about interpretation said, I, I once appeared in a, in a criminal case defending the accused person, and he was found guilty. And the court clerk, in asking me to address the court on mitigation before the sentence, looked at the accused person and said, Malileo, which means Christ. And my client collapsed. He understood by this interpretation to mean that he was being told to start crying because he was going to prison. And I, I took time to address the court on mitigation, making sure that the interpreter did his job. Now, and it's, that was the first time it occurred to me uh, as, a, as a lawyer that if the proceedings, that is the mitigation, uh, was conducted in Kikamba, the language spoken by the accused, the magistrates and I, justice would have been done. But thankfully my client was fined. The Gugi also addresses the, the issue of, of language and the contract in agreement and investment uh, you know, relationships. And he was talking to Zambia when he was talking about the agreements between uh, Lobegula and Sisu Roads. And he problematizes the, you know, the, you know, the language. And I guess he could have given the examples of the Maasai agreements in 1904, 1911. These were blatant and monumental theft by agents of British colonialism that were legalized through law and, and, and language. It's, those agreements were not written in Kimasai or Bemba, but yet the, they became uh, legal. So, and we know that it, it still remains a post-colonial tragedy uh, that the independence constitutions in all African countries legalize the, the theft. In our case, uh, the theft of land. In the case of Kenya, we paid back for the theft of our lands and resources over 70 years. And this was all done in the language of, uh, of uh, law and the constitution. And it doesn't surprise me that this gross injustice is being resisted, you know, by many, many Kenyans. You remember recently the Maasai awarded, you know, the, their, their land back. But we have to look at the, const the independence constitution really as uh, the main culprit of this. Somebody once told me that that constitution is uh, can be compared to somebody stealing your jacket and then they tell you I have your jacket come and give me money so that I give it back to you. The role of law in social transformation as a long genealogy when posed as a question about whether law and the courts can advance, stagnate or impede transformation and this question once the source of serious continuous jurisprudential debates has acquired a consensus that law indeed has the role to play in societal transformation. And this multidisciplinary co uh, consensus is shared by lawyers, economists, policymakers, politicians, international organizations, think tanks. And in coming into effect the new phenomenon of transformative constitutions like ours, South Africa, Colombian, Indian, this, this idea of transformation has been, you know, en, you know, enriched. And there have been debates, as you know, you know, about 
uh, base and superstructure, and that law, cultures, politics, uh, constitutions are part of the superstructure. And the argument that the, the economic base, the superstructure does not uh, merely conform to the economic base passively, and that that base can be progressive or you know retrogressive. So 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 I think that debate is we we basically say that what Professor Hart called the non-legal phenomena uh, has become you know an important aspect then of law and uh, nobody these days argues the law is the law is the law. Uh, uh, that thankfully is, is, is uh, you know, not uh, an argument anymore. The lawyers have, have, have also, uh, you know, uh, adopted uh, Antonio Gramsci's uh, uh, discussions on uh, ideological hegemony, where uh, these superstructural features like law, religion, education, racism, uh, mass culture take a new role, and you can actually use them to dominate people rather than using the, the machinery of violence. This, I, I notice, I've given you names of Europeans, <laughs> Marx, Engels, and uh, Gramsci, but this is stuff you can also read. Uh, it's, re it's discussed by African Marxists, Gugi Wathiongo, we've mentioned it, Isaac uh, Water Rodney, uh, Karimu Hiji, Nabudere, Yash Tandons, uh, Wamba Ndiya Wamba, and there are many, many, many others that uh, as, as lawyers we can look at for basically that argument that these super, super structural features are very, very, very important in uh, the issues of transformation uh, of, of, of society. And when it comes to the judges, uh, I wanted to talk briefly about uh, the notion that you hear in our courts these days uh, about judicial activism. And it's used as a dirty word sometimes. But this is, this is what uh, Professor Pedro Baxi of India says. Uh, he, he says all oh, judges or judicial officers, lawyers are active, but not all of them are activists. And makes the uh, distinction that to be an activist, uh, you must be conscious of the social order that you want, uh, you know, to you know, to, to change. But my view is in improving his analysis is to basically uh, say, and this is the, for my experience in the judiciary, that all judges are activists. Uh, it depends on what, you know, uh, what, what, whose activist you are. Because uh, you, you might be an activist for the status quo, uh, you might be an activist for the Constitution, and in case of judicial officers, we are all supposed to be activists of the transformative, uh, you know, Constitution. So this, this debate, I, I'm just flagging it uh, because I, I, I once had uh, the same debate with uh, the Speaker of the National Assembly, and the president also at some point when they uh, said I was an activist CJ and I told them that they were also activists of uh, cartels and other forces and, and we understood each other from that position on. So the, our constitution is activists and I want to go very, very, very quickly in uh, uh, elaborating that point by talking very briefly about the development 
you know, of uh, our jurisprudence, which I won't bore you with uh, the writings and uh, my dissenting and concurring decisions on that issue, because you will get this uh, paper and you, you know, you read them. But I use the Constitution and the, the Supreme Court Act to uh, categorize this jurisprudence as uh, uh, robust, uh, decolonized, de-imperialized, patriotic, progressive, and indigenous. Uh, all those words coming from uh, the Constitution and the Supreme, Supreme Court Act and, and defined the theory when you, this, this, uh, and, and said that our Constitution is probably the only one, and I think Professor Yash Gai has told me that, that it's the only one that, that is unusual in setting out a theory of its interpretation. And what that theory is, as we developed in the, uh, in the digital migration case, when we mainstreamed it, it's a theory that shuns uh, staunch positivism, that accepts judges make law, that by invoking non-legal phenomena in its interpretation, it decrees uh, judiciary as an institutional political actor. And this theory is a merger of paradigms that problematize, uh, you know, the various, you know, schools of law. And it's a theory that values multidisciplinary approach to the implementation of the Constitution. It's neither insular nor inward looking and seeks its place in the global comparative jurisprudence and seeks equality of participation, development, and influence. And in the courts, <coughs> we, also, we, we, we also adopted the interpretation of uh, international law because we, Article 2, sub Article 6 says that uh, international law is part of our legal system and all the treaties that we've signed. And <coughs> luckily, for us in the judiciary, Joe Ngugi joined us, and uh, him, Kangara, Macau, Gathi, and other people were part of this school called TRAIL, that is Third World Approaches International Law, which we found also very, very, very useful in, uh, you know, building uh, our transformative, you know, ju jurisprudence. And the AJS that I've mentioned, the African Justice Systems, again is the Constitution says that uh, that law has to be promoted. So the traditional uh, resolution mechanisms, uh, again, <coughs> is 90% of uh, access to justice. And yet when we talk of access to justice, we t tend to talk about access to uh, for more, for more uh, courts. So that's the uh, international law. I've given the details of that, of this uh, third world approaches of international law. Very, very, uh, you know, radical, very, very, very useful uh, to not only Kenya, but uh, the African continent. If we are going to use uh, law as a tool of, of uh, trans transformation. I wanted to give one example just to clarify before I finish on that issue on how this theory of interpreting the Constitution affects the common law uh, canons of uh, inter interpretation. Those of you who are familiar with uh, the, the American system, uh, they, they, they are various you know, canons of, of, of interpretation. But in our case, the Constitution is, gives us that theory, and that's what we have 
to fall to fall back on and i wanted to just illustrate that by looking at the legal interpretation within this theory uh, by giving an example of a case that has never been in court but which i'm certain will be in court and that's the uh, the case on uh, gay rights as you know in in, in kenya the, there have been developments the the gay rights activists have been given uh, the recognition in terms of freedom of uh, assembly and association. Uh, there's one case where I think it's Andre Bugwa who got an order to change certificates from Andrew to, to Andre. And although the issue hasn't come in uh, of whether the constitution protects gay rights. If you talk to a lot of people, they say the constitution doesn't recognize, you know, uh, you know, gay rights. I haven't read Naz Baraza's uh, PhD thesis. I'm sure the answer might be there. But let me just, uh, uh, you know, uh, give my own views on this. The interpretation of legal text uh, gives meaning to the physiology and the words that constitute legal provisions. Okay, and how we constitute law or the method of judicial construction, which is the main preoccupation of judges as urged by contesting lawyers, largely turns on the interpretation we afford to law and legal texts. And there is common adage that there can be as many interpretations or understanding uh, of a single legal provision as there are lawyers. Okay, the reason why in nearly every single case there are dozens of lawyers pouring over legal material and advancing various arguments of nearly equal persuasion is because the language of law is malleable and subject to varying interpretations. And at the core is the indisputable fact that language in which the law is represented is to use the words of the celebrated English judge, Lord Denning, not an instrument of mathematical precision. Now, with respect to the Constitution, and going back to the articles in question, which is uh, Article, I think, 35, 40, no, 45, which is quoted because it says, every adult has the right to marry a person of the opposite sex based on the free consent you know, of the parties. We're not talking about gay marriages here, we're just talking about uh, the recognition that this identity is protected under the uh, Constitution. And so since we argue that the Constitution has to be interpreted holistically, then you also have to look at Article 27, that degrees that the state cannot discriminate directly or indirectly any person on any ground including sex. And there are arguments in, in scholarship that interpret sex to include sexual orientation. So, I'm sure when this case comes to court, lawyers will have a few days reflecting common law canons of interpretation uh, that the Constitution forbids, but it's very likely that it will be decided by this theory of interpreting the Constitution, which t talks about principles, purposes, it talks about values. And I don't know how uh, Article 43 can exclude the values of inclusiveness, equity, equality, non-discrimination, protection of the marginalized, if you, you take uh, sexual minorities as marginalized, which they should be, and more principally, human dignity. Because that is another value that uh, Jill and the Ash have written about, and it has a history also, because we were supposed to look at uh, the Constitution from its history and what uh, we wanted to cure. And so human dignity here must 
historically be taken to mean that we were under colonialism, for example, not people. We, is, we were subjects. And the debate whether we as two human beings still uh, wouldn't go away. So those, those particular values, you know, then uh, in my view, and we, within the theory of interpreting the Constitution, in the case of Kenya, we basically saying the language of the Constitution is a supreme one, and it's one of, of resistance and one that ends historical injustices of colonization, where our human dignity uh, as humans was not you know, accepted. And that in the 21st century, to argue that there are some Kenyans or East Africans that have no human dignity is something the Constitution doesn't you know, uh, countenance. The last thing I wanted to say on the the uh, access to justice was the little debate we had in the, in the judiciary about the wearing of wigs. Uh, and the debate I see is, is, is still continues. It was the issue of humanizing the judiciary, the issues of dealing with judicial culture is very, very, very important in terms of access to uh, 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 justice. And the CKRC told us, and, I, and, and, and this is what Nancy Baraza told me also, the, the, the Kenyan people said that uh, judges should not wear wigs and uh, not wear the, the scarlet robes, or whether they are robes or dresses, it's the same thing because it reminded them of the criminal justice system during the Mau Mau period and during the colonial uh, uh, period. So we, we discussed that issue and collectively decided, yes, we should drop weeks. And uh, we also discussed how we should be addressed. As you very well know, um, judges used to be addressed as my lord and magistrates, your honor. So we adopted the value of equity and, and, and basically said that we all be called uh, uh, your honor. And my lord and my lady was dropped uh, through uh, a memorandum I issued. But the only people who praised us were the Christians, as far as I remember. The lawyers and uh, the judges didn't, well, the judges had agreed, but the legal profession, we didn't have a jurisdiction over them, so they still continue wearing wigs, which they get from Nigeria and India and Kiambu. So, um, but we, yeah, we, we the language, I said the Christians said, yeah, uh, judges have been playing God for a long time. There is only one Lord, and you know who that is, so they should stop playing God. And I, I'll never forget one, you know, one judge who came to me and said, for the last 20 years I've been called your honor and I was promoted last month, and now I thought I was going to enjoy this categorization and this is not, it's not, it's not fair. L let me conclude. I know I've skipped quite a number of stuff. You read it from the, what might appear to be an abstract keynote, but keynotes are supposed to be abstract. So language, I conclude by saying, language is a critical bridge to access to justice. The dispensation of justice and the coaching of rights in language, process, and mannerisms exclusive only to only those privileged to access a particular kind of education amounts to injustice. It mutes the voices of those whose lives and language are in the law's shadow by dint of language, power, and wealth barriers. Decolonizing access to justice requires 
a critical examination of the language question and the engagement of all the otherness that makes law and justice illusory for the poor and the uh, vulnerable. And in discussing the theme of the keynote within the Kenyan context, I emphasized how supreme the language of the supreme law is. I see this new law and its language as reflecting the history of our struggles as a country, the achievements we have made, and the transformation we uh, desire. And the power of the supreme law and its language that will be enriched by Kiswahili and other national languages is our power of resistance, the power of new social relations, and the power of our thinking, freedom, and emancipation to a just, humane, and equitable, and prosperous uh, society. And I've said, we've, as I've said, our constitution is not insular. And uh, in its power and language within the continental and global environments, we are ready to expose, export it. I know we always think that the, the, the South, um, you know, can never teach uh, the North, but these are some of the examples where we could export progressive perce perceptions of power and language to other jurisdictions. And finally, I've raised the argument to all of us in the disciplines and as activists about this, uh, you know, activism. And I think the message uh, I was giving is, I recall, was the message that the play that Ngugi wrote called Gai Kadenda, or Omari, what I, when I want, in Kamerithu in 1979, there were young people uh, singing the song in Kikuyu, Mweku Mweku. I think Mweku Mweku in Kikuyu means where are you, or on whose side you are, right? And there in Kikuyu is here. Um, I thought they would help me out with that. As Kenyans, we, we discovered through our struggles that there is no neutrality to injustice, to inhumanity, to inequality, to poverty, to domination, exploitation, and oppression. Once upon a time, in Kenya, we used to s talk about people comfortably sitting on fences of societal problems, but these fences don't exist anymore. So as public intellectuals and activists, we should remember that, that song uh, in Kamerido and decide on whose side we are. And I thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chief Justice. Uh, that is a very good uh, uh, keynote speech. Um, I, I, I was critiquing your dissenting opinion in advisory opinion number, was it number two of 2012? The gender advisory opinion. The gender? The, the gender. The one third. The one third. Yes, yes. Yes, I think yeah. it was number two. Yes. I was critiquing because I want to publish a paper. Mm. You didn't I, uh, critique the majority, you critiqued the I, minority. No, no, no. no. Oh. I was critiquing <laughs> the majority. Ah, okay. And I place you very favorably. Yeah, within, thank you. Within uh, Ronald Dworkin's uh, philosophy. Yes. Uh, his constructive interpretation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I talk about you very fondly, very favorably. I guess had I been there, we would have been two descending. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, mm -hmm. quite fond of you and yeah. your philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, just a question which probably should have gone to the panel. Yeah. Uh, as I came to listen to your speech, came specifically for your speech, a student walked into my office at the law school and told me, Justice, I have an A in Kiswahili, but I got a C in English. 
and I'm told I cannot be admitted to study law. Is there a way I can be helped? And as I came, I, I kept thinking about it. Um, I don't know, uh, within the context of what we are discussing, what, what your views would be. I, yeah, I, 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 think, I, I think this is, uh, you, you probably tell uh, your student to go and talk to Jill Guy, because I think it's a great case of testing you know, those values I was talking about in Article, uh, Article 10, all right, uh, of marginalizations of equity, inclusiveness, and whether given uh, the, the, the provisions of the Constitution and its history, the university can actually be refusing a, a person like that admission because of, because of, of, of that. There could, could be issues there, uh, uh, serious jurisprudential issues. Alternatively, you can pro advise Professor Mbidi that this thing can be challenged and it doesn't look nice. Because if he has a C in, in English and A in Kiswahili, why would, he, why would this person not be glorified? So again, I, I don't think we are breathing life into the, uh, some of the provisions of the Constitution that have to be aligned with policies and also, and also legislation. And I think that will probably be one case that, can, you know, he, he, he can invoke various. Uh, yes, uh, Githu. Uh, I don't want to talk about that. I think we are dealing I thought you were going to talk about that. No, 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 no. We are dealing with that at the Council of Legal Education. And oh, okay. I think okay. it's not a big problem. Yeah. I, I just wanted that uh, for the, to provide a little balance because uh, most of the people in this room are awed by uh, your distinguished service to our country. And I think not everybody here is about to pick a fight with you. So I want to pick a fight on two little issues. The first, first fight you, t you picked up with me, you are in my class, so I was that was first year, and yeah. I have, I have it, <laughs> and I, it is the best decision I, I made. I salute you for that. <laughs> uh, the first issue mm -hmm. uh, is about um, constitutional interpretation. Yeah. And I have tried to spend a little time of my academic life understanding that challenge and uh, I have written a little bit about it. I continue to read a bit about it. And I know that under your influence, the Supreme Court gave a very, very broad stroke about the purposeful nature of our Constitution, its tra transformative character, and the reason why we need to turn our backs to the petty, narrow, pedantic, didactic common law canons of interpretation. I'm afraid I am not a very good disciple of this new movement. The truth is, and precisely because we are in a conference discussing language, language means what it means. The power to enact law is not a, a power that is carried in the pocket of the person interpreting. It is as much a violation of the Constitution if the judge were to transform himself into an ever-ending source of meaning. That's why I do, no, it's not Dworkin's. Is it Dworkin's book? Is it Dworkin's book that has the same theme what is the meaning of meaning? Meaning must mean something, and it doesn't mean everything. In my view, therefore, we must interpret the Constitution in a manner that achieves meaning that is certain, that is stable, that is durable, that provides stability, continuity and certainty. Does that sound like uh, 
a retrogressive, backward-looking apologist <laughs> of a jurist. <laughs> I leave that to these people uh, to judge. Secondly, on gay rights, my position, I am always happy to, whenever I meet my, speak, my students, I ask them, what I told you, where I stood 25 years ago, is where I stand now. It is all of you who have been flapping in the wind, who have now find me, found me where I think we should be. And where should we be? We should be here. Our interpretation of what the Constitution permits in terms of gay rights, to me, is as follows. Nobody will ask you, and nobody is going to require you to tell anything. Point number one, an immutable, fundamental, not for discussion. Number two, nobody will discriminate against you as you access public resources. Hospitals, schools, anything. Number three, do you want to marry somebody else? That is a technical issue. Because what marriage is, is a question in the Constitution. We debated it, debated it ad nauseam. Mm -hmm. We lost it to the religious brigade. It would, be, <laughs> it would be dishonest for us to pretend that we didn't lose it and to smuggle it into the Constitution yeah, as interpretation. That would not be interpretation. Thank you so much, Willie. It's always lovely to hear. <laughs> My answer is, uh, I know you are right. I, uh, it took me three years to influence uh, my colleagues, you know, to accept, uh, you know, a, a different theory of interpreting, you know, the Constitution. Because even if you look at the common law canons, they, they, they have some of the attributes that you've mentioned uh, very eloquently. It's, we allow judges to bring in their, uh, their biases, their ideological oppositions, their political oppositions, by basically saying, if you are in America, you say this is, uh, is modernism. You know, if you are conservative, you say what, it's originalism. There are various, uh, you know, theories that uh, are there, but the, I support what uh, uh, James Kathi, Professor James Kathi says, that you can't, you can't have these two tracks. You can't have, and he's talking about that in judicial review. He's, he's, he's basically saying, uh, if we have the common law track, it subverts, you know, the, you know, the, uh, the constitution. And so my argument, and I think uh, these debates will go on because the, the, somebody is going to go to the, uh, the Supreme Court and argue it. But I know that was, you know, you, uh, you, your position. And what we should think is to see whether the two positions are conflictional. Okay, where there is some, you know, you know, some, you know, integration. But what I was saying is that if you adopt the theory of interpreting the Constitution, then it depersonalizes the biases and uh, the ideologies uh, of the individual or, or judges where they basically hide, all right? And then we start saying, you know, these judges are conservative, these are liberal, these are radical, because I think those are the terms I normally hear used in the, uh, you know, in the Supreme Court of the U.S. Or where judges, we keep on saying, oh, you know, we don't do politics. Okay, now, uh, Professor Oloko Nyango has written a book, When Courts Do Politics. And he has a chapter six which uh, talks about the presidential petitions where you yourself has appeared in a, that is an arena of politics, right? 
Uh, so so this, is, this is a healthy debate, but after hearing you and uh, I heard you, I don't want to say ad nauseum in the Supreme Court, because it was always nice to hear you argue this. It's the whole question of looking at that debate and continuing it in terms of seeing how uh, the, the, the two interpretations, uh, whether they have a common, broad common denominators. And we probably, you know, consolidate, uh, uh, you know, those, uh, those as well. Now as to your, you know, the, the comment. I get this feeling, uh, and I raised this with uh, Cholo Chaloka Beani, who was in the Committee of Experts. I get the feeling that uh, the drafters of the Constitution realized that certain issues were very controversial. And they decided to leave a lot of the interpretation to the courts. Okay, whether it's death sentence, uh, death penalty, whether it's this issue we are discussing, you find that there are certain provisions lawyers will use, you know, to uh, advance a, you know, a particular argument. And I asked Sherlock and they said uh, that was their political position, to basically avoid, you know, what you have called losses and victories, because the issues were very, very, very hotly contested by putting provisions and hoping that the, the courts will holistically, you know, uh, settle the issue because this, uh, the political issues sometimes uh, 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 are very, very, very difficult. And we have seen courts even in America that ruled on uh, the desegregation, uh, this, whatever, you know, the uh, Brown versus the Board of Education. Uh, the South African Constitution uh, decreed gay marriages, but on the ground, you know, that's different. So I think this, this, uh, this particular debate uh, will, will basically continue. The, the beauty of this conference is that it's, it's, it's as made us as lawyers basically, uh, as I said, stop glorifying our ignorance of other disciplines by calling ourselves uh, learned friends. Thank you very much. <clears throat>